All right, here we go. And again, the short version of this is there's probably going to be a lot better explanations on YouTube, but just like bear with me for uh, this kind of more impromptu teaching style. Um, all right, I'm going to go ahead and do screen share. Um, another quick question, Beth, yeah. do we have a doc that will have notes or should we just take notes along the way? Yes. Or do you, you want me to take notes? Take notes. I did set up a benchling for you all a while ago that has the PPIC9 um, plasmid in it. So hopefully, have you been able to access the benchling there that I? Yeah. Set up? Okay, cool. So that might be a good spot to do it because you'll you'll want to be starting to like annotate in the plasmid, get some sequence design there. Cool. Um, yeah. So. Yeah, let's do that. Um, let me know, and I'll, I'll screen share too when we get into the benchling steps and just make sure that we're looking at the same thing. Cool. All right, let's start. But yes, definitely note take is good. <laughs> All right, so here is, you know, when things are on the projector, they're also like sized differently than on my normal screen. So it's a little cranky, but here we are. I'm also gonna minimize this. So I see one of you and I feel like I'm not talking to a black box. <laughs> all right, so you all know the basic concept of cloning is you have a plasmid and you have a gene of interest and you're gonna do something to cut and insert that gene to make recombinant DNA. That's the fundamental concepts of all molecular cloning. Take thing, put thing in, right? Like cut. Yeah, <laughs> cut and paste, yeah, yeah exactly. Paste. What's magic about Gibson assembly is that it doesn't require um, sequences that are specific or that are already pre-engineered into the backbone. You can do it with whatever sequences you want. And it's also a scarless cloning mechanism. So it doesn't, it doesn't leave those restriction sites in the plasmid. So if you need something that stitches together directly, you don't have to rely on there being like a hope for a restriction site that's at the specific location, that's in frame, that has all these other bits and bobs of things that might make the cloning a little bit harder if you rely on traditional restriction enzyme cutting and pasting to do the, the technique. So Gibson has really truly transformed a lot of molecular cloning mechanisms because it's faster, it's easier, it's more efficient, and it doesn't have some of these like sequence specific constraints that you rely on when you're working with restriction enzymes. Is that clear up to this point? Yep. Okay. Um, yeah. I to, go, to make the initial cut though, I, re I just remember it from we, yeah, you, you know, will have plan. to cut. We need the C1 site. Yes. Uh, yes. And we were able to, we had these. Okay. You're getting, ahead, getting ahead of me. You're getting ahead of me. Jeremy's already teaching you guys. So That's right. Yes. So that, that is going to be true. You're going to need a restriction enzyme to cut in the backbone um, to make it linear. Because one of the things about Gibson is that you have to have linear fragments that have overlapping bits. So let's do the kind of generic overview of how Gibson works. And again, this is a guideline from Twist and I'll send you guys the link to this so you can have it to like read it in more detail. But basically they can synthesize pieces anywhere from 300 base pairs to 1.8 kilobases in length. And they'll give us somewhere around um, like 700 some nanograms worth of DNA, um, which is a pretty decent amount for what most molecular cloning applications will need. Um, they, it's cheaper to order them with these twist adapters, but I think for our purpose, probably we'll want them without. And since again, it's free DNA for us. <laughs> thanks, thanks, <Ijem. laughs> Um, we, we can do it without, and then that will make your all's cloning experience a little bit easier. So just to kind of contextualize a little bit. Um, so the way that the, uh, the, skip that part. Um, the way that, find the, okay, here we go. Well, this still has the adapters in it. Just kidding. Sorry, this is not a good <laughs> diagram. Let me see if I can find another one. It gives any views. Yeah, I think their video is pretty good. So there's a here's the schematic. So basically, what you have is your linearized vector, which for you all for EML will be the PPIC9. And it's got these two regions that will overlap with the thing that you all design. So each fragment depending on how big your insert is. And again, that's where twist can synthesize up to 1.8 kilobases. Um, if it's more than that, then you'll need to split your construct up into multiple pieces. And then you just have to design them with these overhangs. So this, this schematic is assuming like, let's say your whole insert is like 3000 base pairs. You'd split it up into two 1500 pairs and each of them would be designed in the same way. You have this orange overhang, which is the same sequence as is in the backbone of the vector. And then you have your insert of choice. 
And then this red sequence can be still part of that gene. It just also has to have that same sequence as part of fragment B. So if you have 1500 base pairs of this, this last 20 or 30 base pairs of that 1500 has to be the same as the first 20 or 30 base pairs of B. And then you have the second um, homology arm or whatever you wanna call it that is the same as the other end of the backbone where you're gonna insert it. And so that's what comes down to with your design when you're making your fragments, you just wanna make sure that you have these 15 to 20 base pair overlapping ends. And then there's a couple of other design constraints. I'll, I'll have to look up and make sure I remember the exact specifics. Like there's something about GC content and there's something about melting temperature and some other bits and bobs. Um, but when you design your fragments, depending on the total length of thing that you wanna insert, you have one that overhangs with the backbone. However many fragments you have, you'll have an overlap between each one and then one that overhangs with this one. And then what's magic about Gibson is that it's a single pot reaction, same as the other. And if it's only one or two inserts, it's like 15 minutes, it's so fast. Whereas with traditional restriction enzyme cloning, it's like a 15 minute digest, a 20 minute ligation, a transformation, like it's a bunch of different steps. And then, and then to do that with multiple parts all coming into one intact construct, you would have to do it as discrete steps for each one. Right. So it's a, it, this is gonna save like everybody's time, everybody's energy, it makes the cloning process so much easier. So what, it, what this mix has in it is an exonuclease, which will chew back one of the ends, um, the five prime end um, of each of the fragments. It has a polymerase, so it will fill in the missing parts and it has a ligase, so it will stitch everything together. So all three of those enzymes are in this single Gibson assembly pot. And the resulting product is a completely intact piece of DNA, which then you transform into. I think this makes a little bit more sense if we can watch the little animation. Where is it? So the exonuclease is essentially making like the sticky ends of the linearized DNA in addition to the insert that you're putting in. It's making sticky ends of the insert. Of the insert, okay. Yeah. Yeah, let me see if I can find that. Oh, I guess if we use a restriction enzyme to linearize the DNA, we should have the sticky ends already, okay. Yeah, but the sticky ends don't matter because still you're gonna need that 15 to 20 base pair overhang. That, that's okay. the thing that matters when after you linearize the vector. I mean, the exonucleus will chew back any exposed five prime, prime ends, so it will do it on the plasmid yes. also. So that's, that's right. how you get the, the overlap. Yeah. And you get much longer overlaps than yes. you do with um, uh, restriction digest, yes. which is only like, Basically. Right. And that's important for the specificity of how your assembly will work. Yeah. You know, it will only go in in a certain orientation and in certain patterns because of the longer right. overhangs. It's not just four base pairs the way that a typical restriction enzyme is. It will be, you know, 15, 30 base pairs, right. 100 base pairs even. It can degrade. Oh, wow. So that specificity will be important for how it actually gets like assembled into an intact product. So I think that this, this is my um, one, and we are not a this animation will help. The only company in the world who's created a premium one. <laughs> I know. Okay. <laughs> Gibson Assembly, developed by Dr. Daniel Gibson and his colleagues at the J. Craig Venter Institute, is an effective method for the assembly of multiple DNA fragments. This is accomplished in a single tube isothermal reaction with Gibson Assembly Master Mix. The method utilizes adjacent DNA fragments with complementary ends, which can be added, for example, by PCR. Which we won't have to do because Twist will just do it for us. The overlapping fragments are added to the Gibson Assembly Master Mix and incubated for one hour at 50 degrees Celsius. During the one hour incubation, the master mixes three enzyme activities set to work on the fragments. First, a five prime to three prime exonuclease right. activity creates single stranded so, three prime overhangs. Oops, let me pause here. So like I said, this could be anywhere from like mm. 50 to like 200 some base pairs, but now you're left with these single stranded and these two are complementary for about 20 base pairs. So they can then anneal. These complementary yeah. sequences then anneal, right. creating the double stranded DNA of interest. DNA polymerase then extends the three prime ends, filling in the gaps, and DNA ligase seals the remaining mix. Magic. Oh. Um, yeah, it's pretty amazing. <laughs> um, do you want to see the rest of the animation? But this is the basic concept. Feel good? That makes sense. Okay, cool.
So then if we go back to our PPIC9, the two kind of core things that you all have to think of when you're setting up your cloning and when you're doing your design work is one, where are you gonna put it in and how is that gonna work? And then two is gonna be making sure that the total construct length that you all wanna design is either within that 1800 base pairs or that you design the overlapping fragments appropriately with the overhangs. So those are the two kind of things that I wanna go through next with this. Um, to make this a little bit smaller so you're just going to have to hope so this is their multi multi cloning site in the ppic 9 vector and it looks like it's got a bunch of different restrictions and enzyme sites that you could use eco r1 or not one i'm pretty sure we both have we have those um although again you can check our enzyme inventory to to just confirm and what this would do let's say we use eco r1 is it's going to linearize the vector at this point which means that you need overhangs of around 15 to 20 base pairs here right this is gonna be part of what you insert into your construct as the overhang that will match the backbone right. to do that first, um, the goal, the, um, if we look back at the diagram, this yellow patch here. So this fragment roughly is gonna be what you'll use as the start of your construct. And then on the eco R1 side on the back end, you would use something like, uh, oh, this is like a GC rich region right here. Maybe something like this, that would be your um, 15 base pair overhang on this end. And that would be the same as the blue on this diagram, yeah? So that's, that's something that you'll just have to start to incorporate into your design. And then the other thing to do then is like looking at your actual sequences. And this is where Jazz, I'll need you to kind of pull up what you guys have been working on to kind of talk through it is designing the overhangs from within if the sequence is longer than the 1800 base pairs that they can synthesize, including this, you know, 15 or 20 on this end and this 15 or 20 on that end. So in total, you actually only get, you know, 1760 <laughs> base pairs or so to actually work with, yeah? So yeah. Overhanging regions are not supposed to be functional. No, that's right. They just need to match because that's the only way that then it will stick and be able to produce the scarless cloning. Yeah. So would it be helpful to give an example and show you what we did with like our iGEM project? Or do you feel pretty good about this and want to like take over screen sharing and talk through some of your actual sequences? Well, I guess this is probably a very obvious uh, question, but like are we using the um, the um, sequence that goes from the five end to the three end or so are we using like the top line as yeah. sequence? Okay. Yes, because the way that this is set up is that your, um, wait, I don't know what this MF1 alpha is. What is this? What is this? I just wasn't paying attention. I didn't realize that this was in here. Does anybody know what this MF1 alpha is? Not sure. I don't know what that is. Is it behind the promoter? It is after the promoter. Yeah, I'm not sure what that is. What you all actually might need to do, I just realized this, is is actually cut with BAMH1 and Eco R1 uh -huh. to cut this MF1 alpha out. Oh. So you actually might need to do an extra level of cloning where you'll have to do a digest and then a gel extraction and purification. This isn't the same plasmid map that I was looking at earlier. I'm just a little bit, hold on one second. Let's see, we've got it from Novagene. What was it? Yeah. Yeah. Was it Novagene? What was the name of the company? Yeah, I think it was like, I think so, Novogene. Novagen maybe? Showing up as Snapchat. Um, hold on, sorry. Let me find your actual. I think I have it somewhere. Novo Pro. Novo Pro. There we go. Okay. I just want to double check that I have the right sequence. Screen share so we can keep looking. I just want to double check because whatever one I put into the um, benchling maybe is wrong if there's something else in here. 
Oh no, this does have the MF1 alpha. Okay, so this has a coding sequence in there, which we're gonna have to remove because what you want to do is put your spider silk genes where this MF1 alpha is. So that's what we'll have to do. So what, so, okay, so let me just back up a step and kind of talk through, let me, maybe I'll whiteboard it just to kind of make it a little bit easier to like uh, map. So your first thing that you're gonna do is take your PPIC 9K and you're gonna digest with probably BAM H1 and ECO R1. You'll have to double check and make sure that these enzymes are compatible because what that's gonna do is take your, uh, and then this is MF, whatever it is, the thingy. And when you cut with those two enzymes, you'll cut this thing out. So this will go from in there to out of there. And it will also create, oops, I didn't want to erase the whole thing. Let me see if I can make a little white square. Right, it'll create a nick in your plasmid. And then you'll have to do a, uh, you're gonna have to run it on a gel and do a gel extraction because this piece, this MF thing will still be in your reaction mix and you need to get rid of it. So you'll have to do a gel extraction, which means you'll have like your gel. Oops, oh, this is still in white. <laughs> it's really annoying. You'll have your gel and then you'll have your, your digest will look something like band here. Did not work. Oh, I can't do a line. That's what it is. Band here and band here. And you don't want this one is your MF that you don't want. And so what you'll do is physically cut out this band and you'll do a gel extraction on that band. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And you guys did this with your, mm -hmm. yeah. And then from there, that is the material that you'll start with, which will be linearized vector with no MF insert. You'll use that for the Gibson assembly. So that's gonna be phase one of the experiment. Is this making sense so far? Yeah. Yeah? Yeah, that makes sense. Okay, cool. So why do we have that there? Is it just like a placeholder of where the gene would go? I actually didn't look to see what that was, the MF alpha one. So it know. looks like it's a mating factor thing. Mm -hmm. Oh, so do you think you need it? If Maybe we need to research it to see yeah. what it's for. That's the thing. Like, so I guess like with yeast, they could do both like meiosis and mitosis. Like in your experience with like the other yeast, Cer CERVCA, whatever, like, do you know, like if you're growing in a lab, do they just do mitosis? Yeah, typically we don't usually sporulate the yeast in our, in our lab. It's just like, it's too much work, <laughs> but you can, okay. you can do it. And then what you can do is have them actually do meiosis and split into haploid cells. And then they, then you can bring them back together to mate. And the, you have to do like a tetrad dissection and a whole bunch of different like techniques that we just like, don't bother doing. Oh, but okay. We work with in our lab are diploid. Gotcha. So, yeah. but, but it's just unnecessary for what we need to do, right? Like we don't have to think about that okay but this definitely is something that you all should check in and make sure is not an essential gene okay because if you need it then you'll have to go back to well if you need it then you don't have to do this digest so that's good um because if you if you don't need it um do you want to say i don't know if we want to save this whiteboard we do it I guess kathy that's probably the first step that we do for the subgroup that is focused on the plasmid and pickia yeah yeah or we can add that to the um, the PowerPoint for tomorrow. Mm -hmm. Yeah, makes sense. All right. Um, if you guys are okay with it, I'm going to go ahead and close and just go back to the um, to the bench link. So, yeah, pathway one. If you need to keep the MF um, alpha gene, then you will just use the single cut, and then you don't need to do the gel extraction. So that would be a nice, easier step. Um, easier method, but if you do need to remove it, then you'll have to do the double digest and, and do the gel extraction. So that's kind of your first decision for your cloning strategy. 
And then also that will have implications too. If you end up doing the cutout with the double digest with BAM and ECO, then you'll design your first overlapping fragment here instead of at the other end of the ECO R1. So this this will dictate then how you decide how do you how do you actually design. So that that will, makes sense. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Yeah. All right. So in terms of next steps and process, would would you all like to just like dive into your sequences, or would you rather me give you like another example and just show you some of the like the overlapping fragment design stuff? Well, I would say like the biggest pending thing is trying to determine. Well, we are. We we're trying to determine if we want to do two different expressions and one would be one of our sequences which is very small mm -hmm. um, i think it would be around like three to five hundred base pairs yeah. since they're more peptides but then if we want to do um, an expression of a partial native spider silk sequence then those are pretty large and i think that could be around a thousand base pairs so we might already be over then in that case no um they can do up to 1800 Oh, 1,800. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So you you got plenty of room for both the native and yours. The lower limit that they can do is actually only 300. So it has to be more okay. than 300. Base okay. Pair. That's so good I would know. I would lean on your 500 then if you want to do two and you could do one of the 500 and one of the the thousand. Okay. Yeah. And that will be really easy then because if the since those are both within the synthesis limit, all you have to do then is stitch on the two complementary ends and then order it and then your reaction will be 15 minutes and then you transform it super fast right? oh, cool. okay yeah oh nice. yeah. yeah um would it be helpful for you all to share your tentative sequences so i can take a peek because the other thing that will happen is that they're going to look at your sequences your coding sequences and if they're super gc rich they may try to like do what they call a codon optimization where they actually mm -hmm. like keep the coding sequence the same but they'll tinker with the a's t's g's and c's to make sure that they can actually synthesize it in a way that will work on their on their technology platform. Yeah, we actually haven't backtracked to the DNA sequence yet. We've only just done the amino acids. So okay. maybe we can do that this week and then send that to you. So that yeah. way you could look over them. Okay. Yeah, that sounds good. That sounds good. Cool. Good. So, I think that's it then. I, I don't have anything ooh. else to add unless you would like for me to kind of do a, a walkthrough of some of the examples. But otherwise, I think you're I think you guys are set. Cool. cool. Yeah. So I guess the two things we should prioritize is figure out the sequence so that we could like backtrack it with the DNA and also figure out like what that MF. Um, are there any other like things we should be aware of on the PPID plasmid? Is it because it's so close to that multiple cloning site and the promoter? That's why it's an issue? Yeah. Okay. Um, it's because it's in this. So right here's your promoter, your a AOX. What is it? AOX promoter. Yeah, AOX one. Yeah. And then what you also, so you need the promoter, you need the gene, and then you need a terminator. So those mm -hmm. are the kind of four, three elements of any gene expression thing that you're working with. So this one has the coding sequence embedded here, and then the terminator is here. And the reason they put the multiple cloning site here, I'm, I don't know for sure. Um, but I would imagine if, if this is an essential gene, then it's to make sure that it doesn't interfere with that essential gene. Got it. Multiple cloning site in most uh, terms just means a spot where there's a bunch of uh, restriction in that oh. place. So you can use it for a bunch of different types of cloning. Yeah, yeah, exactly. It just, so in this case, it's got one, two, three, four, five, six different palindromes all stacked in one very small sequence. So that's what you'll see with multiple cloning sites is like a bunch of right. different sites. So you have the option if you just want to cut one. Exactly. This one. You but you could also cut. Yeah. Yeah. And these are all usually single cutters. They should all be single cutters so that you don't have issues with cutting in the backbone. Oh, I see. Yeah. 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 Exactly. You don't want to play, play Jenga with your cloning. <laughs> yeah. Okay. How does that feel? Are you guys okay? That feels good. Um, yeah. With the extra time, could I show you what the fermentation recommendations are for our, for Picia in particular, since it's a methylotrope, and then you can kind of give me or give us an idea of the feasibility of it, because it has like really defined parameters for fermentation. So I just didn't know yeah. how difficult this would be. This is definitely going to be outside of my immediate knowledge space, so I will do my best, but probably it's going to require some more reading. Yeah. Okay. 
Um, Cause I know they mentioned about like being able to measure or have an idea of how much the dissolved oxygen um, content would be. And I know we have to figure out, I think on average it was like between five and 15% methanol concentration. So we just have to kind of play of what the, the sweet spot is. It's fine that we ferment with meth methanol, right? In the lab. The only thing that I'm a little bit not sure about is the, the volume. If it's a large volume of methanol, then we may have an issue with fumes. Yeah. Um, and we don't have a fume hood in this lab. So that, that could potentially be a problem. So we'll just have to double check on like how much of it you're planning to use for the fermentation. Okay. So then I guess we can just make sure that it's just small quantities for now. Yeah. Um, and then in the future, yeah, we can figure out how that works. Mm -hmm. Um, and then, oh yeah, it was like, so there was two in methanol, I think, um, you, you're putting methanol in the gross media. Is that right? Yeah. 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 I know. Wild. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, that looks like the filtering. Yeah. <laughs> these, these yeast yeah. must use it as a, as a material. Well, yeah. I mean, hopefully the yeast will break it down. So <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's really, yeah. I was kind of like, this as well that they can grow on this as a carbon source. Um, and then I was reading about two different fermentation methods, one which was like continuous feeding. Have we ever done anything like that where like we're continually extracting um, the, the culture in addition to continuously feeding it? Or do we always, have we always just done it like how we do in the Erlenmeyer flasks where yeah. we just let them grow and then extract from there? That's a good question. I, I can't answer that from the old days. There might have been some people who had experimented with some of this stuff before I was here. Um, but what you're describing sounds like it would really require like what's called a bioreactor. So that yeah. Much, like, yeah. And we do have like a very big, very old one in storage. <laughs> so if you would like to try experimenting with it, I think that might be an option. The other option would be to like buy one of the like smaller ones that you. Yeah. Yeah. But I think if, if you do need like introduction of things and removal of things, you probably are going to need a, a bioreactor. Bio yeah. Yeah. That's what I was thinking too. Yeah. But the one that's in storage, is that too long or too big considering the methanol content probably since we don't have a fume hood? Good question. I think, I think uh, maybe Giovanni and I will have to like look into that a little bit more. I, I can't answer that right now. Okay. No worries. Yeah. yeah. Cool. Yeah, I know we have to definitely do a, a bit of research with how the fermentation works because I know the continuous feed was recommended. And I just remember I didn't know if there was anyone in lab who had done had experience with that. Yeah, it, that might be another good thing to put into the slack for like a general request if anybody's had experience with bioreactors or, or continuous feed. Um, and then we can also start to ask around some of our academic partners and see what they know. Because we have, cool. you know, for example, we just went to tour at C16, which is the um, group that's oh yeah well, yeah amazing right Jared oh you saw their lab yeah Jared you want to oh, talk cool. about people? you remember I'm putting Whoa. you on the spot again sleepy <laughs> yeah. really nice they, they speak loudly so what they did was they placed plasma inside um, was, it, was it just they had some some super secret proprietary yeast, yeah, because, because <laughs> which we think was probably the uh, the lip, lipolytica, whatever you know, the strain that's commonly used for like um, biofuel production, right? That's what we think, but they wouldn't tell us. It was like super top secret. <laughs> they're they're the palm oil company, right? Yeah, that's yeah. right. Oh, okay. cool. They would harvest the yeast and then use its minerals to make silk. That's bars. right, and cosmetic additives and all sorts of things. That's kind of what Jazz and Kathy are working on for their spider silk project. And so the, what they need, you remember seeing the little like thing that was yeah, spinning? Yeah. yeah, that's that's what they want to be able to make. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah, so we have people within our like broader network who have worked on this kind of stuff. We could probably reach out to Miles, who is the lab uh, manager at their space and see if he has any ideas or advice. So it, it's, it's not undoable to think that we have people within our community who, who could help. Okay, cool. Good. We got a, a good amount of work cut out for us by October 1st. <laughs> the, the design work is the only thing that has to be done by October 1. The rest okay. of it is always stuff that we can kind of troubleshoot and do later. But I think as long as you can make sure that you have your constructs with those compatible ends and um, and then do the, well, again, we'll have to run it through their software to do the codon optimization, but that at least gives us, if you have it done by the first, that gives us time to tinker with the sequences if we need to. Got it. Okay.
Okay. Oh. And then just to confirm one more time. So like if we have to get rid of that MF factor, that means we're probably going to use the restriction enzyme that will cut that piece out. So we yeah. would have to design based on whether or not we want to keep that MF. Yes, factor. that's right. Okay. Okay. That's okay. exactly right. Yep. Got it. Just that okay. one. End. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Cool. Good. Awesome. Anything this else? was helpful. Yeah, good. I'm really glad. Can I make a plug yeah. for tools of the trade? Yeah. Did you guys see my email? Yeah, yes. we're actually going to talk about it on Sunday because I know um, Hallie wanted to make a list of, of different skills that would be. Maybe we do like a Gibson assembly or, yeah. or, or okay. even like fermentation. Yeah. yeah, I would really like fermentation, actually. Yeah. Awesome. That'd be great. Just let us know. Okay. Well, Thanks. All right. In that case, I will let you all go. Um, if there's anything else that folks want, uh, just call her at me, text me, call me, email me, whatever. I'm here. Yep. Okay. Cool. Yeah. Thank you, Ben. Thanks, Thanks Enjoy Beth. Enjoy your Thanks, time. Guys. Thank you. Um, David, we are still not doing anything now for open plant yet. So cool. um, we'll just, we'll ping you for the next time we have a meeting. Okay, great. Yeah, yeah. I think I'll, I should have my membership in at the end of September because I'm leaving next week. So um, I didn't want to uh, like get the membership and then not come for like sure. a week and a half. No worries. Um, yeah, there's no rush. We just want you to come hang because it'll be fun. <laughs> cool. um, and then also,